to come together and really, you know, all over the nation. What a wonderful thing. While we truly desire to be in, in, in person meeting, uh, this is a great alternative for the, the times that we live in. And we do thank you uh, that we can do that and for the turnout, we can fellowship one with another this way. Um, now, as we turn to your word, Lord, and we look at the issues in this concerning the gospel of the grace of God, uh, my prayer is that we would all have a heart for your word and to just listen to what your word says um, and stand stand on your word, stand in, in the King James Bible that we teach out of, Lord. Uh, we do thank you for your love. And we thank you for your grace. In your name, amen. Okay, so my topic this morning is the gospel of the grace of God. This is the particular aspect of the mystery explaining how God is forming the new creature, that is to say, who can get into the body of Christ and how someone gets in this body. So if you would, come with me over to Acts 20, 24. Acts 20, 24. Because really what I want to you know, this is, we'll talk about the, the gospel of the grace of grace of God. Um, how does somebody get saved? That's really what we're going to talk about here. Um, so the, look at Acts 20, verse 24. Paul speaking. He says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul received something from the Lord, his ministry, the ministry which I have received. And that involves testifying to the gospel of the grace of God. You can turn a little bit over. So that's really what we want to look at here. Look over at Galatians 1. Galatians 1. Paul said he received it of the Lord Jesus. Look at Galatians 1 and verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, and that's the gospel of the grace of God, which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's saying that what he teaches, the gospel of the grace of God that he teaches, he received from the Lord, of Je Lord Jesus Christ, not from any, any man. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. I've always found that to be a very interesting verse when he, he's claiming the authority of his apostleship where he says, not of men, neither by man. I've always looked at that and thought, not of men, that would be the 12. Or neither by man, Ananias, who's the one that came and met him uh, when he was in Damascus there. And what he's certifying, everything that we teach about Paul, everything that Paul teaches hinges on whether or not verse 11 and 12 are true. Did he get a new ministry? Did he get something special revealed to him from the Lord Jesus Christ or not? And that's really where, where the issue is, because there is something. I was in a men's Bible study, and we went through Romans one year, and they, everybody kept talking about the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Finally, I said, well, guys, maybe we should define the gospel. And everybody looks at me like, well, you're crazy. Everybody knows what the gospel is. So we went around, and, said, and nobody knew what the gospel was. I think they all did, but they all had something else. And I said, you know, that Paul's is what, where the gospel is, is where we find the gospel. Well, Paul was just a little capstone. He was a little cherry on top of the ice cream sundae. The, the, the gospel's been the same throughout throughout the Bible. No, it's, there's been different different ones throughout time. Get Matthew 24 and Jeremiah 30. Matthew 24 and Jeremiah 30. And, you know, a lot of times... Well, any of you that have heard me teach at all have certainly heard me say this. We don't study the Word of God rightly divided. We don't consider ourselves dispensationalists, grace teachers, preachers, believers. We don't do all that so that we're the smartest people in the room. We do that 
because that's the way the scripture is laid out because we have a ministry like the dean just brought up a ministry of reconciliation that we need to take out to the world but the world's not teaching right now if you ever didn't think it mattered if you haven't noticed in the last two months how much the proper gospel matters in the world that we live in you need to pay attention more there is i mean you all know i'm very active on facebook to my detriment probably but there is a whole bunch of teaching on facebook which that's not where you should get your teaching about the gospels and what they're saying is it's not the gospel there's a bunch of people that are going to believe facebook and they're going to end up in hell claim in jesus name but what i want you to see here is there is look what Jesus says here, Matthew 24 and verse 3. Disciples have asked him, hey, how do we know the, the end of the world? Verse 4. And Jesus answered, saying, said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Then he shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, so shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences. Oh, there we are and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. This has nothing to do with us. This is, they shall, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise, shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that sh shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall preach in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Jesus is talking about something called the gospel of the kingdom, which is not what we're going to see today. Paul teaches the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the kingdom, it's verse 13. The person that endures through all those things that came previously endures to the end. Guess what? That person is going to get saved. He's going to get delivered out of it. It's not soul salvation. That was... Good news. Look at Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, that he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds. Strangers shall no longer, no more serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. There's a gospel of the kingdom. That Jesus says is out here, and it's going to be he, he, him completing his plan with Israel. When they endure to the end, they'll be, they'll be saved. As we're going to see here, that's not the gospel of, of grace of God that Paul's teaching. We're going to be very clear when we, we're sharing the, the gospel with people today that they are getting the right gospel, not enduring to the end to be saved, not turning from their sins, not making Jesus Lord of their life, not saying the sinner's prayer, not saying the Lord's prayer, all those things. It's a ministry of reconciliation. God's not imputing sin to the world today. The Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day for your justification. And through that, you get put in an entity he's creating today, the church of the body of Christ, with the heavenly hope that you can never lose. And we'll look at, that's kind of the message in a nutshell there. But... <laughs> So, well, we got 45 minutes of Q&A now, um, <laughs> but so let's go through it. Come with me, if you would, to Ephesians 2. April's in an email chain with somebody that thinks that what's going on today is the end of the world and the end, the end times. And going and claiming those promises and and it's not an academic exercise people are believing that, believing that you know you guys have all seen second chronicles seven fourteen. you know say that prayer and then god will take covid away from america well never mind the rest of the world still got it it's shipwrecking their faith april said just said and she's correct all right ephesians 2 verse 13 but now time passed but now Ages to come, we live in, in the but now, in the time in which God is dispensing grace, the dispensation of grace, Dean just went over. The but now is the time that we live in. In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, Jew and Gentile, 
hath broken down the middle wall of partition. That middle wall of partition is the law. It separated the Gentiles who were afar off from God and with Israel as their intermediary because there was that middle wall of partition, the law. Well, how do I know it was the law? Because the next verse tells us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to men making himself of twain, Jew and Gentile, one new man, so making peace, and he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. In the but now he's, he's making the one new man, which he calls in verse 16, one body. Verse 17, came and preached peace to them which are far off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father there's the gospel of the, of the of the grace of god as we take it now because he, he, here he's talking to save people the gospel of the grace of god we're going to see is clearly what paul reveals to us about the, the the events of the cross and what they mean to the gentiles that salvation has come to the gentiles now through the fall of israel but it doesn't stop there it goes on and, and it reminds us it teaches us that we now have peace with god romans 5 and there's that good news for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father uh verse 312 tells us we have that that we have boldness with access and access being saved we have boldness to god the father to the creator we can approach god the father we can approach the creator with boldness and we have access to him anytime we want and can i tell you he wants it more than we take advantage of it and i want to let you know that Romans 5, we says here we have peace. Romans 5 tells us being justified by faith, we have peace with God. With the creator, with the supreme, the supremest being there is, we have peace. He has so much power, he spoke and created something out of nothing. And when you think of nothing, you think of something. But his nothing was truly nothing. That's how much power he has. And we have peace and access with him anytime we want that's not part of any gospel before paul because even the even the jews weren't that way they only had one man had access once a year and he didn't go in boldly he went in with a little trepidation he didn't do everything perfectly he gets zapped we don't have any fear of that we have access to him whenever we want it and we need to want it more uh get acts 9 with me and acts 26. Acts 9, verse 1. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went of the high priest, priest, desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether them, they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So he's going out to, to get, a, he got arrest warrants against the little flock. This is not what so many say, the Jewish Christian church or the Christian Jewish church. These are members of the little flock. Okay, they acknowledge that Jesus was their Messiah. They got saved under Peter's program, if you would. Okay, repent, be baptized for the remission of sins. These are not people that have believed in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins today as a present possession, because that information hasn't even been shared yet. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly there shined Round about him a light from heaven, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Lord, who art thou? Well, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. He trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what, that, what thou must do. Paul, with a head of steam, in full rebellion, the Lord Jesus Christ appears to him and tells him he's got something for him. Now look over at verse 15. You'll find out what that is. For the Lord said unto him, talking to Ananias, but the Lord said unto him and the Ananias, go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. The question is, well, who can get saved? Well, according to that verse, it would be Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. 
not just about everybody, is that is everybody. Look over to Acts 26, verse 15. Paul's going to give his account of what just happened. Acts 26, verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Okay? We're going to find out why Jesus made Paul, why he appeared to Paul. To make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen. What has he seen? That's the road to Damascus. He's seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And the, let's be clear on what he's seen here. He, he's going to give a testimony. You see this over in 1 Corinthians 15, that he, is, well, he was the last one to see the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. As time went on, Paul got more, we call it progressive revelation, got more details about the dispensation of grace that he was that he was teaching. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom send thee. I went through this because I want you to see Paul's account of what happened on the road to Damascus is that the Lord Jesus Christ told him at that moment that he was going to send him to the Gentiles. At Acts 9, not at Acts 28, at Acts 9. Paul was teaching the dispensation of the grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God, the one new man, those issues, maybe not all the fine details, but he, he knew the program. He, he understood this immediately from the beginning. He understood his ministry was to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the children of Israel in that order, which is opposite of what Israel's was. Israel's was Jerusalem, Samaria. Uh, I'm missing one. <laughs> Judah. <laughs> Judah and then to the rest of the world. Paul understood from the very beginning he was sent to the Gentiles. He's always from the very beginning be teaching the gospel of the grace of God. It's important because when we read anything of Paul's epistles, we need to understand it is for the church, the body of Christ. Every book Paul wrote is to the church, the body of Christ. And no, he didn't write Hebrews. Look over at Ephesians 1. And the dispensation of grace... In the but now, God is creating the one new man, the church, which is Christ's body. Look at Ephesians 1 and verse 21. Verse 20. Which he wrought, God the Father wrought his mighty power in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Okay. So now our, our viewpoint is not earthly. Our point of view is heavenly. Now to make sure we, we understand the context, the context is the heavenly places here, not the earth. Far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is his body. It's the body that he's going to use to fill those principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. It's not the point of my message. I want, what I want you to see is the church, the body of Christ, is, is what he's using to fill these positions. There's some other things, though, going on. That's part of that one new man, the church, the body of Christ that he's building. Look at chapter 1 and verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace we did this the other day i'm going to take this down if you need it we can get it more i trust that daylene has that we did this the other day here and it took almost the whole lesson he's creating the church the body of christ today now in that just real quick We've seen we're accepted. We are, we have redemption through his blood. Don't miss the blood. Forgiveness of sins. Heavenly hope. That was what we read in 20 to 23 there. Um, Look with me at Ephesians 3, verse 8. Uh, 
Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, what grace, Paul, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So I'm going to put here the knowledge of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, you could go all day filling out things about you now that you are in Christ. Literally, Laurie Verstegen wrote the book on the subject. Okay, so you can get that. You can spend a whole lifetime studying this and over and over and over. What I want you to see is all the, the wonderfulness that we have being a member of the church, the body of Christ. The issue then becomes, well, these are all good things. Who can get in there? Who can get into the church, the body of Christ? Did God pick before the beginning of time? It was going to get in the church of body of Christ. Because that's a big thing going on going today as well. Right. He determined, predetermined what was going to happen with the body of Christ. Again, we just read in Acts 15 that Paul was sent to Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Look over at Titus 1.11. Titus 1.11, for the grace of God, well, we're talking about the gospel of the grace of God, that bringeth salvation, hath appeared to all men. It's appeared to all men. Now, teaching us, not only the grace of God that brings salvation, appeared to all men, but the grace of God, it also teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldliness, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, purify unto himself a peculiar people, I'll put this one up here, zealous of good works. That's who you should be. That's what he died for you to be. Now, good works are not things done in your flesh. They're things done, powered by the Holy Spirit. What I want you to see is the gospel of the grace of God. God's grace does more than just save us. It teaches us. When we get in the, and get in the word, understand it rightly divided, study it rightly divided, it's going to change us. It's going to teach us. Paul, there, there are verses where Paul talks about how he had to learn to be content. That offers me great hope because I can be fairly hard-headed at times, I'm told. And... It gives me great hope to understand that, okay, there's a learning going on. If, if the great Apostle Paul had to learn some things, that means I am okay to learn some things, but I need to understand that this verse, if my learning comes, it's the grace of God that teaches me. Now, how does the grace of God do it? Through the Word of God, through the Holy Spirit, using the Word of God. But don't think, okay, the gospel of the grace of God is, is how we got saved, and that's, that's it. And that's often, you know, we, maybe some of us say, well, that's clearly not true. But, you know, that's, that's clearly taught today in a great amount of Christianity today. Okay, you get saved by the cross. Now you need to go do and give you a laundry list of things that you need to do to stay in goods, God's graces or receive favor from God. This is, you're on that religious treadmill. It's God's grace that teaches us how we're supposed to do these things. We need to remember that. We don't get saved by grace and then go put ourselves into the law. We get saved by grace and then we can go live by grace. How do you know how to live by grace? Because grace teaches you. How does grace teach you? The Holy Spirit through the word of God rightly divided. It all comes back to this book. Look at 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Verse 3, 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. The grace of God that bring us salvation hath appeared to all men. God will have all men to be saved. I don't see anything about it saying only the people that God preselected before the foundation of the world that grace appear to, or that God will only have the people he selected before the foundation of the world get saved. 
everybody. He, it's available to everybody. Look at First Timothy 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Do you know that that verse does tell you there are some people that Jesus Christ didn't come to save? Those that don't sin. It's an important distinction too because I understand nobody sinned. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Everybody's a sinner. But for that person that walks around saying, I don't sin. Can't get that per oh, that's a person who can't get saved. Jesus Christ came to save the sinner. If you don't acknowledge the need for a savior, you'll never get there. That's why when we share the gospel with people, we need to, to, to explain to them they are a sinner. We need to explain to them the consequences, the wages of sin is death. That they will have an eternity spent in the lake of fire. Grace, grace of God that it saved, bring a salvation that appeared to all men. It's God's will that all men get saved. Here he says, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Sounds like God will, can, save everybody. Now, that the first in second, first Timothy 2, he goes on to say, He'll have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Can I tell you, when Paul uses the word truth, almost always he's talking about his gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You, you, you search out, he starts talking about the truth. He's talking about what the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to him and that he did to us. God will have all men to be saved, but he's not done with you when you get saved. He wants you to grow. He wants you to get edified. He wants you to become a, a, a mature saint, understanding the word of truth rightly divided, right? He doesn't call it the word of God rightly divided, rightly dividing the word of God, though that's what it is. He calls it rightly dividing the word of truth because it's all truth. Here he says he wants you to come to the knowledge of the truth. Come with me to Romans 2. I know the, the people from Portland have a running bet to see if I can get this done in time, and I'm going to show them, I'm going to show them all wrong. How do you get into the church, the body of Christ? How, how, do, you, how do you get accepted in the beloved? How do you get redemption through his blood how do you get forgiveness of sins how do you get this heavenly hope how do you how do you come to know the unsearchable riches of christ by the way he says he's to make known that the unsearchable riches of christ because they weren't searchable before you can't go back here and through genesis through early acts find this find the riches of christ they were unsearchable but they are now revealed to us by the holy spirit through the writing of the apostle paul dean talked about that verse over in corinthians earlier you just go on to the next verse. It says those things have been revealed to us now. Okay, that's that Dave Stout paraphrased. But. Okay, so uh, some of the things that we're, that a person is told on how they can get into, uh, how they become a Christian, how they can, they can get saved, become a member of the body of Christ. Well, many people say you just need to repent from your sins. You just, just become a good person. Look at Romans 2 and verse 6. Oh, verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do those things and doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You think you're going to be able to say, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not as bad as that guy that were, I, I get to heaven. Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, know, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. If you want to stand before the great white throne, according to your deeds, he's talking to you right now. To them, who by patient continuance and well-doing, seek for glory and honor, immortality, eternal life. If you live a perfect life, if you can patiently continue in well-doing, you can have eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, 
to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. That verse 11 here, you might not think about it. That's a powerful verse. For there is no respect of persons with God. And we just saw three verses that said, all men to be saved, all men, uh, the grace of God appeared to all men, and he came to save sinners. That verse says there's no respect of persons with God. In other words, God doesn't, didn't, didn't pick out a certain group of people before the beginning of time and have a certain amount of respect for them that they're going to get saved, and the rest of us are out of luck. Don't, don't miss how important that verse is. That verse destroys Calvinism right there. Um, look over at uh, Romans 3. So clearly, if you want to, you, you, your deeds aren't good enough. Romans 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No and no wise, for we have before proved both Jew and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, none that understand it, none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throats an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used to see. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You can go over here and do everything that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John says and go to hell. Because it's not the law how you get justified. It's understanding the historical prophesied events that happened on the cross. There was a hidden meaning, a mystery meaning revealed to the Apostle Paul that through the fall of Israel, is Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for my sins. He was delivered for my sins. He was buried. He rose again for my justification. When I put my trust in that, when I understand that God says that's enough to pay for my sins, when I come along and agree with God, I get put into the church, the body of Christ. If I put any value on anything that I have done or can do or need to do after that fact, you make the cross of none effect. As we just looked at, there's none that do with good. The issue is not what we can do. It's the issue is what Jesus Christ did do. Well, one more thing. Let's get, get Romans 2 and Exodus 32. Romans 2 and Exodus 32. Romans 2, verse 4, we just read this. Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? That's the other thing we're told we need to do. Repent from our sin. By the way, repent does not mean to repent of your sins. If you repent, just means to change your mind about something. In the context here, the repentance is... Don't think that the, the goodness and forbearance and long-suffering of God, it means God is not there, does not exist. Those are the very things that should lead you to change your mind about your need for a Savior. It's the fact that he's not zapping you today. that you, the, the fact that you have violated his justice and he leaves you with the chance to get saved should lead you to that issue. The fact that he's, that, that he's long-suffering, that he's forbearing, should lead you to that issue of change your mind. Because it's so often said that, well, repentance means that you've got to turn from your sin. Look at Exodus 32, verse 12. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, this is Moses speaking to the Lord, for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn away from thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine self, and sayest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of you will I give it unto your seed, and they shall inherit forever. 
and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. If repent means to turn from your sins, that means God returned from his sin. God didn't turn from his sins. It's just a, ch a change of a change of, of thought or change of attitude about about something. Okay, so we want to be very clear. It's not repentance that gets you saved. Okay, it's faith. Um, yeah, I'm at 37 minutes, so I'm going to lose that bet. Uh, baptism won't do it. It's only. But let's look at that one. Look at First Corinthians one. Several years ago at the um, Rockaway uh, conference, uh, Richard was talking about, Pastor Richard Jordan was talking about baptism, and uh, some people had brought some, some friends, and we got to talking about that, and, and they seemed to understand some things about baptism. It was very shocking to them, um, and they got back to Portland, and the people that actually took them to the conference, they won't have anything to do with. Three years later, they still haven't spoken, to the best of my knowledge over this issue of baptism. Baptism is a big issue. You know, people tell you, you must be baptized to get saved. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. He talks about, he did baptize some people in uh, 14 and 15 and 16. He, he says, you know, I did baptize some, some but I, I can't remember if I baptized some others and any, there are those issues. But then he understands, he comes, while he's there in Corinth, he comes to understand that he, he, he's not to be baptized. Baptizing is not a part of the program in the dispensation of grace. It's not part of the gospel of the grace of God. So he's no longer, he never was a great baptizer to begin with. It doesn't appear. It doesn't appear he was baptizing, you know, 3,000 at one time, anything like that. But look what he says about this, about baptism. You need to be baptized to be saved, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but... That means something different's coming, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, as the cross of Christ made, made it of none effect. He puts baptism and preaching the gospel on opposite ends of the spectrum. It's not, well, he taught me to preach the gospel and then baptize some that wanted to be, to be an outward expression of an inward faith. He said, no, no, I wasn't sent to do that. What I was sent to do is to preach the gospel. Well, what gospel? Well, the gospel of the grace of God. We've clearly established that. What does that tell you? Baptism has no part in the gospel of the grace of God. People come along and want to add that, they've got a problem. If they put, in, if they put any amount of faith in that, that water ritual for their salvation, they're going to have a problem. No, let no flesh glory in his sight. If you're going to glory, glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. The issue is what happened at the cross. The issue is not something that we have done. I'll be very clear, and I know that upsets a lot of people. Baptism has nothing to do with the gospel, the grace of God today. It's not just, well, whatever. It has nothing to do with the gospel, the grace of God today. Come with me to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, you're saved by grace, through faith. Okay, your faith, we'll figure out, we'll, we'll look at what that faith is in, in, in just a second. But it, it's, it's God's grace, right? Mercy, not receiving what you do deserve. Grace, receiving what you don't deserve. By grace are you saved through faith, not that not of yourselves. It's not baptism, it's not repentance, it's not making Jesus Lord of your life, it's not all those things that you're told to do. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. If you look up the word, by the way, gift, the word gift means free, freely given. 
So when Paul talks about the free gift, he's like the free free gift. He really means it. Not of works. No works. The works are excluded. Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You're saved by grace through faith. Now you should go live a life pleasing to God, but out of, out of appreciation. That's not my lesson, but the verse was there, so I use it. Look over at Romans 3, verse 26. Twenty-four, twenty-three. For all have sinned. Remember, Paul said, Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. That verse says, all have sinned. Okay, that means God is willing to save everybody. There's nobody that God is not willing to save. And I understand sometimes that really offends us, right? Nobody's ever shared the gospel with somebody where God's going, oh, I hope he doesn't believe it. Or so nobody's ever gotten saved where God went, ah, oh, bummer. And I understand that offends our sensibilities, right? There are some people we, we hope aren't in heaven. But, and then hopefully there's nobody hoping we're not in heaven. But for all of sin come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's where? In Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a fully satisfying sacrifice. Isaiah 53 says God looked down on, the, on his soul, the travail of his soul, and was satisfied propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. That's these sins out here that the Old Testament saints but today to declare I say at this time in the but now that we live in his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which what? Believeth in Jesus. He's just. God doesn't look the other way when you get saved and say okay your sins don't count. The penalty was paid. Now his justice has been satisfied. He's just. Now that that now that that sin debt's been paid, he can now justify you. He didn't look the other way. That would not be just. That would it would not be just to say, okay, those don't count. Jesus Christ died for your sins and for my sins. That issue settled. Now he can justify. You. Believeth in Jesus. What do you need to believe? I mean, that's a good question, right? There are lots of people that believe Jesus was on the planet and was a really good teacher. That's not going to do it. I'll say something controversial. There are descend, literal descendants of, a, uh, of April, literal, literal descendants of Israel on the planet that believe Jesus is their Messiah and not their Savior, and they'll go to hell. They can believe an Old Testament message today, and it won't save them. It's important to believe what Paul tells you to believe. It import, it's important to tell you what the belief is. Well, thank goodness God doesn't leave us without an, an answer. Romans 4, 21. Speaking of Abraham, if you want a definition of faith, it's not Hebrews 11, 1. It's Romans 4, 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. That was not written for his sake, that's Abraham alone, that it was imputed to him. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That's what you need to believe. Look over with me, if you would, at 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. We started this this morning talking about he received a ministry from the Lord Jesus Christ involving what he called the gospel of the grace of God. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The events of the cross were not a secret. Clearly, he just says, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. 
what they meant to the Gentiles was a secret, was a mystery. Because it couldn't have applied here because God was still dealing with Israel out here. And the Gentiles had to go through Israel. Through the fall, think about this. Gentile salvation, Gentiles being declared righteous, they had to deal, they had to go through Israel. That was supposed to be a nation of priests. God's blessings to blow out through Israel to the rest of the world. When Israel fell, what were the Gentiles then supposed to do? The Gentiles had no hope. Well, it's like God knew what he was doing. He raised up Saul, Apostle Paul, gave him this message of the gospel of the grace of God through that through the fall of Israel, salvation now came to we didn't raise up to this level. They came to our level. God commuted us all in sin, committed us all in sin, but he might have mercy on us all. Pretty, that, that's genius. That We wouldn't do it that way. Uh, and then he goes through down here. Look down at verse uh, 8 and 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. The last person to see the risen Lord Jesus Christ was Paul. Nobody since Paul has seen the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says he was the last one. Okay? You have to believe Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again for your justification. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. I lost the bet. Two minutes. Two minutes? Yes. Okay. We'll end it here then. The topic the, regarding the gospel, the grace of God, who can get into the body of Christ and how one someone gets into this body? You get in by faith. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. The question is who? Back to who. Right? I spent a lot of time dealing with that. This verse clears it up wonderfully for me here. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. For that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. That's the world's view of the preaching, not God's view. Okay. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that what? Believe. That's it. The issue is belief. You get into the body of Christ. All of these things, and this list is so lacking, it's embarrassing. All these things you are predestined to, you are predetermined to as a member of the church, the body of Christ, they all apply to you. You can never lose that salvation. God did not pick before the foundation of the world who was going to get saved, who wasn't going to get saved. He said, I will save anybody that believes. And that's awesome. It's not based on us. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. According as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the morning once again and the ability to come together and, and have a conference like this. Uh, we do thank you, Lord, that you have come up with this 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 plan for salvation. I don't want to call it simple, but but you do it. You call it the simplicity of Christ, and, and not that it's dumb. It's that it's it doesn't require us to come up with our twelve point point plan, our fifteen point plan that we couldn't do number two on. You've just said, "I've sent my son." I think what he did was enough to cover your sins. We just come along and believe and agree with you. Understand Jesus Christ died for our sin, was buried and rose again for our salvation. And that moment we put our faith, we get put in the church, the body of Christ, sealed forever. Would you thank you that you have so much love, so much grace for your creation, that you your son died for us when we were sinners, when we were without strength, unable to get ourselves out of our own predicament, and we were when we were your enemy. Think about it like that, and we understand your grace is 